Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As we are about to begin, we ask for continued cooperation this evening and wish you an enjoyable session. Please ensure that you are signed in with your full name, first and last name. For record purposes, you can, you can right-click on your name where there will be an option to make any necessary changes. Lastly, we would like to inform you that this event is being recorded for storage and archives. Therefore, to ensure the integrity of our production, we kindly ask for your audio and video functions to be turned off. Thank you once again for joining us this afternoon and for your cooperation. It is now with great pleasure that I hand you over to the chair for today, Zimula Pachi. Hi, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a special warm welcome to everyone. I am Demiola Pacheco, Public Relations Officer of the Pathology Club of UE. I would like to thank you for joining us for this, our 15th installment of the Caribbean Pathology and Laboratory Medicine Student Initiative, CPAMC. The theme today is Surgical Pathology. At this time, I am honored to be introducing the speaker this evening, Dr. Melanie Johnsler, who will be sharing her wealth of experience in surgical pathology today. But before we begin, I will give a brief insight to Dr. Johnsler and her work. Dr. Johnsler attended Yale University School of Medicine, then went on to complete a combined anatomic and clinical pathology res residency at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School with subsequent subspecialty fellowship in general surgical pathology and gastrointestinal pathology at the same institution. In 2017, she became an assistant professor at, of the pathology and laboratory medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College, where she still serves as an adjunct assistant professor. Dr. John Tiller has contributed over 20 publications and continues to publish in surgical and gastrointestinal pathology. Um, she also con contributes in global health education, as we will witness today, and the practice of pathology in resource restric restricted settings. She's currently a consultant pathologist of the Port of Spain General Hospital in her home country of Trinidad and Tobago. Certainly, Dr. John Tiller is an inspiration to many of us in this medical field. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Melanie Johnsela. Thank you very much for that lovely, lovely introduction. I'm just seeing a face and a name that I can't ignore, so I just have to tell Andrea hello and hope she's doing well. I haven't spoken to her in a while. Um, okay, so I'll just share my screen and we'll get started. All right, you should all be seeing that. I'm gonna full screen it. Yeah, see in the screen. Perfect. All right, so I was given the kind of very heavy title of Roadmap, a career in anatomic and, and surgical pathology. And I mean, when you think about giving a talk on roadmaps, you think just what you know, um, Demula described about me, right? I went to med school, I did rotations in AP, I had an interest in pathology like you guys do. And then from your perspective, if you're all in UE, you're wondering, should I do the DM program? Should I go to the UK? Should I go to the US? Should I do fellowships? Should I do academic, you know, like Cornell stuff like she mentioned, or stay in UE or do private practice or both? Um, and then, you know, the road kind of never ends though, right? So you could kind of give a talk on any of these kind of paths along the, the, the road because what, what I do kind of every day is I have to maintain my skill and I also do a little bit of research on the side to maintain that academic kind of curious side of me. Um, so I figured instead of a roadmap, I'm going to kind of change the title a little bit if I'm allowed and I'm going to I'm going to go with life on the road of an anatomical pathologist or a surgical pathologist. So I'm basically going to take you through one of my days that I might have had a couple of weeks ago and I hope it works and I'm sorry this isn't as interactive but certainly it's about a 45 minute to um, an hour talk so there should be time for questions or comments and by all means put it in the chat and I'll address them after. All right so 
it's a random Thursday morning, you wake up, you have your slides, you know, Histotech, the Histotech gives you the slides in your bin. Um, if anyone knows me well, you know that I thrive or I need to survive on coffee. So you always have your coffee or your tea or your water if you're far healthier than I am. So your first slide comes across and you look at the requisition form and it's H412, you make sure the name matches with the number and it's Mr. C. And Mr. C is a 53 year old man who presents with bright red blood per rectum. So you all know this from medical school. You're thinking cancer immediately, especially in a man of that age. Um, he's referred to gastroenterology for a colonoscopy. You know at this point that I'm quite partial to gastroenterology, so you'll see a little bit of GI path in this first case. What they, what they see in the requisition form is that there's an, in the ascending colon, there's a pedunculated polyp. And in the transverse colon, there's an irregular mass, as you see here, that's pretty suspicious for malignancy. And you kind of have to call that cancer, right? It's an obstructing, very irregular mass. So they take biopsies of both. So let's just start with the first um, biopsy, that part A, that ascending colon pedunculated polyp. Now, one of the tenets of pathology that I have to say in every single teaching session, every single lecture is a pathologist needs to know explicitly what is normal before being able to identify what abnormal is. So for you, but in pathologists in the group and for really anybody, you kind of, you know, even if you're going into internal medicine, you need to know what a normal heart sounds like, what normal lung sounds like. So it's the same sort of thing. You need to know what normal histology, non-neoplastic histology looks like before being able to identify um, neoplastic pathology. So let's just start with normal colon, right? So it's the stuff outside of this polyp. So if you look at normal um, colonic histology, these are called colonic crypts, right? And the colonic crypts are very round and they're very regular, all right? Basically what this is, is you're taking something that's three-dimensional and you make like three-dimensional, like a cube or like a, a sphere, and you're basically cutting it and making it two-dimensional, right? So in the colon, you have these crypts that effectively, you know, the crypts of Libacoon, as you guys might have learned in histology, that dip all the way down. But because it's a three-dimensional structure that you're making two-dimensional, you'll see these nice round structures that almost look like flowers, um, regularly spaced. And in between, you have lamina propria. And all you need to know about the lamina propria is that it looks like this. It's white and blue because there's a normal sort of inflammatory cell milieu in the lamina propria. There's some eosinophil, some lymphocytes, and some plasma cells. All right, we know what normal is. So as long as you know what normal is, you'll be able to spot now, and this is up to you, to spot if anything is abnormal. It's kind of like, I don't know if I'm too old, but Sesame Street, one of these things is not like the other. That's kind of how we're, you know, we kind of go about. It's not as simple as that, but that's the best analogy I could think of. So let's see what this polyp looks like. Now, in this polyp, you'll notice that it's just a little bit more purple up top. Um, I'm just gonna change, right. The, you'll notice that it's very, very purple up top and you're not too sure why that is, but you know it certainly looks different from the normal because this looks pretty kind of pinkish with the white and the blue. And then on the surface here, this looks really, really dark blue to, to purple while this looks like this. So you're already kind of identifying that there's something different. And I'll tell you that this, when you have this kind of surface purplish look that we look more into in, in the slides coming, that's what a tubular adenoma looks like. And a tubular adenoma is basically low-grade dysplasia. So for this, when you're, you know, signing out cases, we get a lot of these from, you know, the GI docs, they'll say it's a polyp. And all you're basically looking for is that surface purplish look. And that indicates that this is a dysplastic lesion and it's typically a low-grade dysplastic lesion. So what is dysplasia? And I know you guys have probably covered this and this is just my kind of ad hoc definition. It's the acquisition of a morphologic change. That's purple change in the epithelium 
which predisposes that tissue to carcinoma. So you have normal, then it goes to low grade dysplasia. You have a tubular adenoma, and then you'll get high grade dysplasia. These cells even get a little uglier, but it's not quite cancer. So it's a tubular adenoma with high grade dysplasia. And then it becomes, frankly, carcinoma. So just so you know, a colonic polyp with low grade dysplasia is a tubular adenoma. And it's a tubular adenoma because it has these test tube. It still maintains the architecture of the colonic mucosa. It still has that nice kind of test tube look. So that's why we say tubular adenoma. So in some reports, this is just a little pet peeve of mine, you might see tubular adenoma with low grade dysplasia. That literally means a colonic polyp with low grade dysplasia with low grade dysplasia. So how I sign this out, as you'll see, is tubular adenoma negative for high grade dysplasia. But let's be pathologists. Let's actually, I just keep saying, you know, Sesame Street and know what normal is, but let's really kind of get into what a pathologist does and how a pathologist identifies dysplasia because sometimes it's not terribly obvious. So one of the things of dysplasia is basically you have like a molecular aberration that leads to a, molecular, a morphologic change, right? So you have normal, and then all of a sudden you have an area in the mucosa that has some sort of molecular aberration. So what you'll have is an abrupt change. So you'll have an abrupt change. So you have normal looking crypts down here, nice small nuclei. It doesn't look particularly purple. And then all of a sudden at the surface, you have this abrupt change to this kind of purplish type of look. And what that is really is the nuclei. So let's look at even at higher power, let's zoom into 40X. You have your nice script and it's lined by these epithelial cells with really round nuclei. For, for those of you that know, this is a plasma cell. So if this is a plasma cell, this nucleus is just as round as a plasma cell and only slightly larger, if not the same size. A tubular adenoma though, once it acquires that kind of dysplastic um, morphology, they tend to have these long pencilate hypochromatic nuclei. And that's why it's purple. It's purple because the nucleus is taking up way more space in the cytoplasm and the volume of the cell than in normal. So it will look more purple too because those cells are bigger and those cells are more hypochromatic. So you basically at this point, you basically at this point know how to diagnose um, a tubular adenoma. And the, the mutations, as you all know, that are responsible for this acquisition, this, this kind of morphologic acquisition that predisposes the mucosa to carcinoma, APC, as you all know, um, <coughs> adenomatous polyposis coli. So that's the gene that's mutated in sporadic adenomas, but it's also the gene that's mutated in FAP and an attenuated FAP, you know, Gardner's syndrome, all of those things. And then KRAS, which is just like mutated in a lot of different types of, of cancers. But I won't get into too much of the molecular. Okay, so we've done, you know, we've called the tubular adenoma, negative for hybrid dysplasia. Now we get to the business, right? Because uh, the only person in medicine that could really call definitively carcinoma is your pathologist because we're actually seeing the, the slide and the tissue itself. So let's see what we already know what normal looks like. And we already have a very, very high suspicion because we work in a team and the GI doc says, this is an obstructing mass. This is going to be cancer. It has to be cancer. So let's see what carcinoma looks like in contrast. So we have normal, notice how regular the crypts are, I could almost predict where the crypts are. Notice that lamina propria, again, white and blue. Let's look at what this carcinoma biopsy looks like. And I've actually spoiled the whole thing because this is carcinoma, right? If it wasn't carcinoma, we would have to actually ask the GI doctor rebiopsy again because that gross feature, the, that those endoscopic features are so kind of classic for carcinomas, except in very, very rare circumstances. But this is what our biopsy looks like. So remember I said the lamina propria looks white and blue with scattered, you know, inflammatory type cells with your plasma cells and eosinophils. Instead, what you have here is you have kind of this fibrotic type of look, this pinkish, pinkish look that's mixed with a little bit of gray. 
That's called desmoplasia, and that's effectively the stromal response to cells being where they shouldn't be, because cancer is invading, right? Cancer is actually invading into you know, the lamina propria and the muscularis mucosa and the submucosa. So the, the stroma is basically trying to say, geez, stop, you're injuring me. So desmoplasia is that kind of fibrotic response. So once you see desmoplasia, you should be relatively comfortable in calling it, um, in calling it carcinoma. And then the next thing is, I told you, look how nice these crypts look. Look how regular these crypts um, are. They're like, you know, you know, very, very easy to predict. Here, I mean, my gosh, the crypts are not really crypts. They're trying to be with these little holes in between them, but you have like a nest of cells here with crib forming, which I'll talk about in a second. You have another area here. Nothing is predictable. It's haphazard because it's growing wildly. Let's see what that looks like at, at higher power. So rather than regular, schmegular kind of crypts, you're seeing crypts that are fusing together. You're seeing this sort of attempt at luminal formation, which is called cribriforming, this kind of cookie cutter punched out spaces is called, is called cribriforming. And then inside you have cells that are kind of dying because they're proliferating so fast in the middle, you're getting a little bit of necrosis. So it's dying in the middle. And then the cells of the, you know, the nuclei of the crypts, they're supposed to be small and nice and well behaved, but instead here you're getting hyperchromatic, haphazard appearing nuclei that are overlapping each other. So we have here the ingredients for um, invasive colonic adenocarcinoma. So you finished one case, you know, you call the ascending colon polyp a TA, and you call the transverse colon mass an invasive colonic adenocarcinoma. And, then, and you probably want to call your doc and say, hey, this is carcinoma, it's moderately differentiated, which I'll get to. So they, re they you know, recommend a resection in this man. It's a transverse colon mass. Let's just cut to a week. It's not exactly a day in the life. So let's cut to a week in the future. The specimen comes to you. So what else does a pathologist do, right? So before looking down the microscope and, and sitting at the scope and, and typing up and doing all of that stuff that I just talked about, before all of that, you actually have to do a gross description, all right, which is this picture in front of you, which is our specimen that we got from Mr. C. And what do we do with the gross description? We have to tell you the size of the tumor, how deep it grossly goes, if those margins, if those colonic resection margins on either side of the picture here, if those are negative. And then we have to search through this pericolonic fat on the outside here to look for a bunch of lymph nodes. And when I say a bunch, I mean greater than 12 lymph nodes in colon cancer. So that, and then we have to look under the microscope to see if they're positive. So there's a lot to be done, um, you know, when the specimen comes down from surgery. That's why sometimes just, uh, you know, incidentally, when someone does a surgery and then they call like two hours later and they're like, hey, what's the result? I'm like, eh, we haven't even grossed, completed the gross of the specimen yet. So this is just kind of informative for those of you who don't even want to go into pathology. It takes some time. So what we do all of that type of stuff for is to stage the cancer, right? Because the stage is the single most important prognostic factor, right? We all know about stage four, we all know about stage one, and we all know about the difference in survivability between a stage one and a stage four colorectal ca um, cancer. So how do we do that? The first thing, so there's T and M. I know you all know it, but a refresher is always good. And the um, T stage is basically telling you how deep the carcinoma goes in the entire colonic wall. So if you just follow my arrow here, this is that mucosa that I was talking to you about. So for tumors here, it's basically in situ. This is the muscularis mucosa that separates the mucosa from the submucosa. And then, so if a tumor is here, if it's in the submucosa here, it's a T1. And then this is the muscularis propria, right? It's responsible for the movement of the bowel, as you all know. If, it's, if the tumor goes all the way through the mucosa, submucosa, and into the muscularis propria, that's a T2. And then see this space, there's a little bit of a space here in between the muscularis propria and the very, very bottom, which is the serosa. If it's there, it's a T3. And then if it breaches the serosa, it's a T4. 
All right. So we basically have to, uh, us as pathologists now, we grossly look at how deep it's going after we cut through the specimen. But then we look under the microscope and see, okay, it's in the muscularis propria. It's a T2. Then we look at the lymph nodes. And then if, you know, the, the um, surgeon is doing a laparoscopic is doing an X lap and they notice some sort of you know lesion in the liver and they take that, we will be able to tell the M stage. But more often than not, we're unable to tell the M stage if somebody just gives us a you know a transverse colon resection. Okay, so let's continue with the role of the pathologist in colon cancer. There's a lot of other things that we have to do that are prognostically relevant. So the, the one thing that we do is we have to say. Um, what the grade of the tumor is. So grade is effectively how closely the tumor is attempting to recapitulate that of normal colonic epithelium. So this is a well-differentiated tumor and I'll call it well-differentiated because it's still sort of forming little kind of crypts. It's tr there's a lot of lumen formation at least. So you'll call that well-differentiated. Moderately differentiated, it's still forming, you know, lumina, but it's more, it's a little bit, um, it's still less than 50% in terms of solid formation, um, but it's not as, you know, it's not like, it's more than 5% rather of, of, of um, gland formation. I think I misspoke a little bit. So effectively what I'm saying is well differentiated, most of it, so 95% of the tumor is forming these nice lumina in moderately differentiated. It's less than that, but it's still greater than 50% of the tumor is forming glands. And then something that's poorly differentiated, most of the tumor is solid and not forming glands. Effectively, what the WHO has done here is well and moderately differentiated, all goes into low grade and um, poorly differentiated is called high grade. And there's a 50% cutoff, which is why I was like kind of speaking a little bit in circles. So effectively, if you have greater than 50% gland formation, it is low grade. If you have um, less than 50% gland formation, it is high grade. It's very simple now. So that, well, but you will see in a biopsy results well differentiated or moderately differentiated or poorly differentiated. The other thing we do is we subtype. There are a lot of, if you look at the WHO, there are a lot of different subtypes of, um, you know, colorectal carcinomas. So I know these images are a little bit small and I'm happy to share these slides after, but effectively you're not even seeing too many glands or too many epithelium hair. You're seeing too much of the epithelium hair. You're seeing these kind of wide lakes of, you know, gray blue sort of material. So that's mucin. Um, so this is a mucinous colorectal carcinoma. Then you're not seeing it too well here, but you can have a signet ring cell. And I'm sure you guys have seen signet ring cells. Those are kind of epithelioid or round cells that have the nuclei pushed way, way, way to the side. They're eccentric. And the, the cytoplasm is chock full of mucin. It's intra uh, cytoplasmic mucin and then medullary, which is just solid. And we'll get to see a little bit more of these as we go along. Then, as I mentioned, we stage. So in this case, that tumor, that well-differentiated tumor, is involving the muscularis propria. So that's a T2. And then we have, we look at all our lymph nodes. And if we look at our lymph node here, our lymph node is just supposed to be blue, made up of lymphocytes. But instead, there's that well-differentiated carcinoma right under um, the capsule of the lymph node. So it's N1A because there's a, a, a positive node. And then there's also what, what the other things that we do is we also look for the presence of high risk features like lymphovascular invasion. So in this image down here, what you have is an artery and then right next to an artery is always a vein for the most part. Um, and then that in, within this vein is, you know, a colorectal carcinoma. So you have lymphovascular invasion, you have T2, and you have it meta lymph node. It doesn't bode well for the patient. And then the last thing that we do for the most part is we ensure that the lesion is completely excised. So all around the lesion, that radial margin, and then those mucosal, that distal and proximal margin. 
so this is what a, a report looks like. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. And again, I'm happy to share these slides. But if you know you've ever seen a path report, it might look something like this, where we have to fulfill either the Royal College of Pathology or the you know CAP uh, Canadian American sorry, the College of American Pathology kind of synoptic forms to, so that the oncologist is guided appropriately. But there's more. So how, so, so a lot of pathology in terms of research anyway, is or, you know, we always talk about bedside to bench, like taking things that we've done research wise and bringing them to the clinical world. It's kind, it could be kind of opposite for pathology because we're taking what's on the bedside or the surgical table and we're bringing it to the bench and that's how we kind of discover you know colorectal carcinogenesis different molecular aberrations etc so let's talk about colorectal carcinogenesis for a second and you all know this this is one of the first so most colorectal carcinomas um, their pathogenesis is through something called the chromosomal instability pathway the sin pathway um, and effectively what you have is you have normal um, colonic epithelium, it acquires a mutation in APC and KRAS, and you get that tubular adenoma, and then you have that dysplastic lesion, and then you get more mutations in, say, P53 or something along those lines, um, and you'll get frank carcinoma. So that's kind of classic, you know, it's basically most of the colorectal carcinomas, this is, this is data in the US because we don't have really fleshed out data in Trinidad quite yet. Um, and this is just talking about the lifetime risk of the average population in the US is 5%. And most of them are sporadic, you know, 75% of cases um, of, are just kind of these sporadic kind of cases. But there's another pathway that um, contributes or accounts for 15% of colorectal cancers, and that's the microsatellite instability, MSI, or mismatch repair deficiency pathway. So what that is, is that there's a mutation in mismatch repair genes. So mismatch repair genes are MLH1 and PMS2, and those are dimerized, those are joined together and MSH2 and MSH6, which are also joined together. And what they do is they kind of track along DNA. And we know, right, A is supposed to go with T and G is supposed to go with C. And they kind of look for mismatches, right? So they look for, you know, oh no, a G is going with a T. And then they will clip that out and say, bro, we need a G with a C or A with a T. Now you could imagine, if you have mutations, deleterious mutations in MLH1 and PMS2 or MSH2 and MSH6, you'll get mutations all over the place because it'll be like the wild, wild west, right? G will go with the T, you know, the A will go with the C, it'll be insane. And this, you could get sporadic mutations or you can get mutations like hereditary mutations, which will lead to Lynch syndrome or as we know it's hereditary non-polyposis colorectal carcinoma. Incidentally, MLH1 of the pair, MLH1 and PMS2, MLH1 is the dominant. So if you lose MLH1, you'll also lose PMS2, basically. Um, same thing with MSH2 and MSH6. MSH2 is the dominant. So if you lose MSH2, you'll also lose um, MSH6. So the thing that we need to know about this, um, even though we don't do it as regularly as we should be doing it in Trinidad, is the MSI tumors confers a good prognosis. And if the tumor is MSI or mismatch repair deficient, it actually reduces the, the benefit of FU-based chemotherapy. So your oncologist may actually decide differently with those stage two um, mismatch repair deficient or microsatellite unstable Carcin colorectal carcinomas. And it's a, the job of the pathologist to identify those for prognostic and predictive um, reasons. <coughs> what we have noticed, or what we what I kind of do in Trinidad, because one, not everyone can afford, you know, the microsatellite, microsatellite instability testing or immunohistochemistry. Um, the histologic features that are overrepresented. In, in these types of colorectal carcinomas. And if I see them, 
I strongly, strongly suggest that we, we somehow get, um, you know, this testing done because it could really kind of inform the patient's future care. So one of the things I look for is in this uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or adenocarcinoma with intra epithelial lymphocytes. So you're seeing lymphocytes here, lymphocytes here, lymphocytes here, or where all the arrows are. If you have a lot of those, that actually, it might likely very well be uh, a mismatch repair deficient colorectal carcinoma. If you have mucinous tumors or even signet ring cells, so here's a slightly higher power of the signet ring where you have this kind of eccentric nucleus and then you have intracytoplasmic mucin, that's also more likely to be MSI or MMRD. And then if you just have solid, a solid, solid tumor with a lot of intraepithelial lymphocytes as you do here, that's called medullary um, and that's also more likely, <coughs> excuse me, to be uh, um, um, MSI colorectal carcinoma. So as I mentioned, the current recommendation for all colorectal carcinomas is to do immunohistochemistry to look for the loss of proteins, MLH1, PMS2, MSH2, MSH6. It's actually not done on all here. So, but, you know, but these are the things that working in a, in a low resource setting trying to get them done so we could kind of, you know, give the patient the best chance as possible. So let's go back to Mr. C. It just turns out that Mr. C was able to get um, mismatch repair immunohistochemistry. And for, your, for those of you all that know immunohistochemistry or don't know immunohistochemistry, it's really easy. If the protein is there, it's brown. If it's not, it remains blue. So with this, what you have is within the stroma, right, within the stroma here, there, it is brown, right, there is some MLH1, but within the tumor itself, because it's this kind of tumor we're looking at here, it's blue, it's not brown at all, so there's no MLH1, and remember I told you MLH1 goes with PMS2, so if you do have MLH1, you bet your bottom dollar that you're not going to have PMS2, but you'll have MSH2 and MSH6, so what I do in that case is I add an addendum, and I say, you know, it demonstrates loss of nuclear staining for MLH1 and PMS2, MSH2 and MSH6 are preserved. These results <coughs> suggest the presence of an abnormality in DNA repair mechanisms affecting MLH1, which is basically telling them this is a microsatellite unstable carcinoma, or you can also say these words are interchangeable, mismatch repair deficient um, colorectal carcinomas. So just a little bit, 3% um, of MSI carcinomas are associated with Lynch syndrome. It's, you know, if you see a young patient, if it's right-sided, if it's bulky, if the patient has a family history, you'll know about Amsterdam criteria, et cetera, it's more likely going to be Lynch syndrome and it's associated with a host of other carcinomas. So much so that even the, in the States, the endometrial carcinomas in the States, they do mismatch repair um, deficiency testing, the same IHC that I, that I told you about. So we're, we're getting there in terms of getting those stains, but uh, you know, we, can, we can certainly discuss the hurdles to get that um, at the end of the lecture. Okay, so we're done. Oh, no, no, that's just one tray of slides. You have a couple more cytology cases and you have a rose scheduled later this afternoon. And we'll talk about what a rose is, but just in case you're like at the edge of your seat, a rose is a rapid on-site evaluation where you're able to look at the specimen, if it's a cytologic specimen, at the site of the operation. So, you know, keep that in your mind about how your day is going, all right? So let's just look at a couple more fun cases to show you. And I'll stay away from the GI, it's just, you know, close to my heart. So let's go, we have slide C46 in our tree again. And this is a 42 year old with a <coughs> mass and a superficial parotid gland, right? So we're seeing this very well circumscribed lesion on the left side. They do a FNA um, of the lesion and you all know about FNA and you all might have even done some in med school where they just kind of go in with a needle and suck it all out to try to get some cells. And then they smear it on a slide so that the pathologist and cytologist can take a look and see what it is. But this is a pretty um, 
standard lesion. So just kind of remember what it looks like. It was pretty firm to the touch. It wasn't hurting her all that much. It was just kind of big and a little bit on the annoying side. So when we do cytology and, and we get those slides prepped, um, they do a pap stain, just like you know what you get in like a, your cervical smears, the pap stain, and that's supposed to help us look at the nuclear quality. And then they do uh, we do a Romanowski stain, which is, helps us look at if there's any extracellular matrix, or you know look at the cytoplasmic quality. So this is the pap, and what we're seeing here is we're seeing a lot of grunge, right? We're seeing this kind of a cellular material with maybe a few of these ovoid cells in between. And then on this side, we're seeing kind of these sheets of cells almost forming a kind of honeycomb pattern. Now, <coughs> sorry about the coughing. I'll tell you all why later. Um, the, now, we don't have anything normal to compare it to. So in cytology, it's an entirely different beast than the actual histology, but an anatomic and surgical pathologist, if you're a general pathologist, you have to look at all of this stuff. So you just kind of learn that something that looks like a sheet that looks kind of honeycomb-ish, those are ductal cells. And in the salivary gland, they're always these little ductal cells. And, and rather than you know taking a three-dimensional structure and cutting it as you would in histotechnology, in cytology, you're taking this three-dimensional structure and you're smushing it against the slide. So it looks completely different. So I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if you're like a little bit on the lost side in this case. But it's pretty and it's just something that you should know and there's no exam for this talk, right? It's just so I could convince you to come over to the dark side of pathology. Now, this is the Romanowski stain for this lesion. And what you're seeing, again, rather than that schmutzy sort of stuff that we are seeing on the pap stain, you're actually seeing this kind of, um, I'm, I'm not ignoring the troll in the corner, I'll let you know about it. You're seeing this kind of frilly extracellular kind of material that looks like troll hair, and that's in the textbooks. That's how fun pathology is. So what you have is this kind of, you know, very, you know, um, magenta kind of purplish looking thing that almost looked like if I were, you know, taking this guy's hair and kind of making it even more afro -y than it is. And this is, no, I wouldn't say pathognomonic, but very close to being pathognomonic for a pleomorphic adenoma, which is one of the most common lesions that you'll see in the parotid gland. And it presents exactly like I presented with KC46 at the beginning. So for something like this, you're like, oh, okay, this is benign. It's consistent with a pleomorphic adenoma. Um, usually patients would either want them out or if there's any kind of suspicious looking stuff, the head and neck surgeon will go ahead and take it out. This is what it will look like. Um, very, very well circumscribed in the salivary gland. So this is salivary gland um, tissue here that looks lobulated and kind of pale, um, <clears throat> reddish. But then you have this very firm lesion um, that's well circumscribed. And then under the microscope, what you'll see is you'll see those cells that look like duct cells, right? These kind of ductal cells, but now you're taking like a three-dimensional and you're actually cutting it. So you're seeing lumina as opposed to the kind of um, honeycomb type of look. And then you're seeing this cartilaginous sort of matrix. And that's what the troll hair, that kind of very magenta spread out thing. Um, that's what, you know, it, it, that's the equivalent of it on cytology. So there's a pleomorphic adenoma. You will see a bunch, even if you don't go into pathology because it's quite common. Ah, okay, so you finish up the day, uh, you're doing a little reading, you know, you probably have, I, what I do, I take a little bit of time throughout the day to maybe do a little project or think about a project that I wanna do. I, of course, always have my coffee because the coffee reminds me, oh gosh, I have a rose schedule. I have my rapid on-site evaluation schedule. So I head down to the endoscopy suite to get that, to, to be present for the rose. Let's see how that works. So I'm introduced to Mr. J. Mr. J was a 50, is a 50-year-old man with a borderline, sorry, that's a typo, resectable tumor 
of the unsinate process of the pancreas. The docs are just like, listen, I just want you to call this an adenocarcinoma so we can either go to resection one time or tell oncology and see if they want to give neoadjuvant, you know, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So what they do on what the very skilled endoscopist does is they actually go down just like they're doing an endoscopy, right? Um, but there's a little bit of a, there's a camera on an ultrasound kind of imager on the end. So you could see the masses, you could see the liver, you could see the pancreas, you could see all sorts of things. So let's see what we saw, all right, in this case. And this is an actual real case that we did about uh, four or so months ago. So they go down with the camera, they're in the duodenum there, they put on the ultrasound, they see the liver, and you kind of know this is the liver, right? Little portal tracks and stuff. And then at some point they reach the pancreas and they see this massive um, uncinate and pancreatic head mass that's really well circumscribed. Now, this is a little bit of a zebra case I'm telling you right now because pancreatic adenocarcinoma tends to be very infiltrative. It tends not to be very well circumscribed as this is, all right? You kind of see in the outline of the lesion. So the surgeon or the endoscopist takes that's the needle and they, they, they kind of try to get as much as possible because they're like, yeah, we just need to know what this lesion is. And what I'm doing is I'm on the side of the endoscopist and I'm waiting for that needle to come out so I could put the, um, the specimen or the little droplets onto the slide and smear it like a cytology slide and stain it right there in the room. All of this stuff happens within like a five to 10 minute period of, of being in the room while the surgeon is like, oh, or the endoscopist is like, let me know if I have to go again. Let me know if I can, you know, come out. Let me know if we could wake up the patient. So it's a little bit exciting, a little bit of a high pressure situation. So this is what I saw. So I, I smeared it out and I actually did an H and &E. I didn't do a pap stain or, or, or Romanowski or anything. And just to orient you, this is a neutrophil. And I saw these really big cells here, but not without a lot of cytoplasm. And I saw this, which is a mitotic figure. And again, I saw this, which is another mitotic figure. And then here, what I saw was kind of molding, like these cells were kind of crushing next to each other. And molding is a, if, if anyone is in pathology and the hair, they say molding, that's a sign usually of a small cell carcinoma, which is very, very rare. In the, in the pancreas. So what I do, I come up from my microscope, I say, hey, malignant cells are present. It's really suspicious for a neuroendocrine carcinoma, small cell type, but I'm gonna have to do immunohistochemical stains and really collect more tissue so I could, you know, or more cells so I could get those immunohistochemical stains. And this is what um, I did, and I don't expect you all to kind of get it, but Effectively, what I did is I got a clump of those cells and I made it into one basic bowl so I could send it for immunohistochemistry. I did a keratin just to confirm that this is a carcinoma, this is epithelial. Then I did a synaptophysin. Synaptophysin is a stain that stains anything of neuroendocrine or endocrine origin. So it would stain a small cell, it would stain a, um, you know, a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. And then I did a key 67 and a key 67 stains all the mitotic cells. And you can see this is all brown. Basically everything is brown. So it kind of confirms that this was actually a pancreatic neuroendocrine carcinoma, small cell types. So you know how you get small cell carcinomas in the lung? This unlucky man had a small cell carcinoma of the pancreas. <clears throat> This is just the very, very long write-up. This is the actual diagnosis that I gave um, that confirmed it. And the reason why it's so important is because, you know, this really dictated his um, treatment because he had to get platinum-based chemotherapy as opposed to even try to kind of resect it because the histology really mattered. If I said adenocarcinoma, but the surgeon might have gone ahead and tried to resect it based on you know how nicely circumscribed it was but because it was small cell they actually have to treat, change the chemotherapy entirely so that was 
um, you know, a day in the life and a week later type of thing. I was particularly busy because we had the rules scheduled. And I think at that point I will finish up a little bit on the early side, but I'm happy to take any questions. I'll also stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, so do we have any questions? Feel free to enter them in the chat. If you want, you can turn on your mic as well to ask the question. So in the meantime, um, Doctor, if you had to encourage someone who's deciding on their specialization um, path, what would you say to them? I would say, uh, well, I would say what I was told. Um, and there were two things I was told. Think about the most boring thing in the specialty. Um, and like, just ask somebody in the specialty, like what the most boring thing is. Um, and if you could tolerate that, more likely than not, you're supposed to go into that. And then it's really about immersion. So don't be afraid because, you know, um, most people are nice and most people have been where you all have been before. So um, most people will take you under their wings and show you really, A, this is really what it is. So I would, I would do a lot of immersion into, um, you know, whatever specialty it is. And you kind of have to like it, right? And I, that's, that's the most important thing. And what I tell people about, everyone asks, you know, why I went into pathology because pathology isn't a very, let's be honest, it's not like a sexy kind of field. And, you know, it's, um, it had a bad reputation back in the day, a couple of decades ago with the personalities of pathologists and whatnot. Um, so people were quite surprised when I decided to go into it. I really like, like that troll hair thing, that pleomorphic adenoma. And I know I'm going to sound like an absolute dork right now, but you know, it's just being recorded. It is what it is. Um, is my second favorite salivary gland tumor because it's pretty. My, my favorite is adenoids is sick. So you just have to kind of go with what you like and don't really take on anybody too much because it's your whole life and you want to spend your whole life doing something that you enjoy, but, but do your due diligence first. And it's okay to change your mind, I would say. Yeah, I agree. And you can't really teach passion you just need to search for it. And as you said, you know, you'll, you'll find it. Um, how do you see um, the future of pathology in terms of technology developing um, the role of the pathologist? Do you see that changing? Absolutely. I think, um, fortunately, not in my lifetime, but maybe in your lifetime, I think the, um, I think molecular, I think we really need to, to push molecular both in patho we, we already do in pathology residency actually i think that's the most pushed because we're so close to the tissue and that's what you, you kind of have to learn that <clears throat> but even in med school because everything is so molecular now like next gen sequencing next generation sequencing is done on not even you know it's obviously done on all neoplastic lesions but it's whole exome sequencing is being done to figure out why someone has like a random you know, autoimmune disease or something along those lines. And we kind of need to understand it and understand the vocabulary by which to, um, you know, even talk about it. So I think, and, and right now I would suggest that you kind of do that on your own because I think in about 10 years, you're going to be talking about, yeah, boy, instead of colorectal cancer, you'll be like, gosh, boy, yeah, Keras, G12 demutation, P P53, we don't have any actionable mutations for this one. And the oncologist is gonna call you and say, do you have a, you know, do you have a BRAF there? You know, and you're gonna to have to be able to have that conversation because they kind of do that now. Also regarding the um, rules, the rapid on-site evaluation, is it actually rapid? Because I saw that you would have had to do follow-up. So your Chi-67, your synaptophysin, et cetera. Yeah, so with that, so I showed you all that one because that was a, just a very rare one. And I think I, we're actually writing that case up. But um, usually what happens is you it, that particular one wasn't so rapid because I just have to say I'm very suspicious of the neuroendocrine. Don't do anything until we do these stains because you don't want to make a decision. But usually what's done is they, they, they do the FNA 
often be even smear it, I say consistent with adenocarcinoma, person either gets, goes directly to, you know, resection or goes directly to chemotherapy. And we spare them that way because you could imagine if someone does a biopsy and they miss, that patient has to wait the, you know, three, four days for the path to come back as non-diagnostic. And then um, they have to go back to the endoscopy suite, go under anesthesia again, get another biopsy, as opposed to me just saying, nah, it's just blood, go on, take some more. So that in, in some ways it is rapid. Usually Understood. it's rapid. Okay, so we have a question here. You can go ahead and turn on your mic. Um, hi, good evening, uh, Dr. Chancela. It was a wonderful hi. presentation. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I do share that passion for surgical pathology, have, though having a background in heme path from nice. India. Yes, nice. and I am uh, wanting to pursue a career in surgical pathology. Uh, okay. There were brilliant cases in the presentation. I was just wondering that, uh, is there a molecular uh, workup done for the tumors as well in terms of like, if we have a cancer, do we have methylations and CGMC uh, sequences or maybe workups on solid tumors like, or NGS done in routine uh, there where you're practicing? So we, well, not in the public system, Okay. And in the private system, um, we do do so with um, mismatch repair, we would do the immunohistochemistry and then to just save on the cost rather than doing the methylation of the MLH1, okay. we would do, um, we would actually send them for Lynch testing right. one time. Right. Um, and there's a surprising number of Lynch cases in Trinidad. Right. And then for the solid tumors, so for lung ca carcinomas, Trinidad has a very good relationship with Roche. So okay. we send those lung cancers to get PDL1, IHC, ALK, EGFR, not ROS1. Um, I think there's one more that we get um, that just slipped. I think that might be the only one. We used to be able to get foundation sequencing on the lungs, but, but right now we just get the actionable ALK, EGFR, and PDL1. Right. Um, but it's all a we. It's all, we all have to send it a we right now, but there's some labs, I think St. Augustine, right. that, that they're trying to get the, the kind of next gen and molecular type yeah. of sequences going. In, in terms of reducing the turnaround time for the follow-up for the, this thing, so that we have an in-house thing out there. Yeah, we should, I mean, if you're into HEMPAP, you know that molecular, yes. I mean, the ELL and stuff. So I encourage you to get my email address. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, I'd love to actually, and, um, I, uh, I did my uh, I did my cancer specialization from Tata Memorial in India. That's like okay, the big okay. center. So we used to do NGS that had just initially started when I left my fellowship. So Can we get my email address. We could chat because yeah. I think a lot of I think, uh, and and uh, join up with the Path Society and stuff because we're, we're trying mm -hmm. to get things rolling. It's just it's just tough, you know, right. in a, in a low resource kind of setting. I agree. Yeah, that is. I would love to have your email. Thank you so much. Sure. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we have another question. You can go ahead, Mr. Lai. Oh, hello. Well, thank you for this amazing uh, presentation, actually. Oh, um, I just have a question. It, I guess it more pertains on how pathology practice is done in other countries. Um, like I'm currently in Canada. Okay. Uh, and, you know, just to have an idea, like in Trinidad, do you follow like the CAP protocols in, you know, when writing the reports or do you follow more like the British system? I'm just curious. That's an excellent question and, and actually a, a topic that, that um, I'm writing about because there's no Trinidad guidelines. So you basically practice wherever you've been trained. So I was trained in the U.S., so I use the CAP, but other um, pathologists who are trained in the British system go by the RCP. Um, and then, so, but it, it usually doesn't cause much of, a, of an issue because the RCP started to do the synoptics. So it's actually similar-ish now that there's no, you know, they mightn't have like tumor budding. I think they do actually, but it's, it's, it's sort of similar now where it's not that big of an issue, but it would be nice um, if I could, it would be nice to have a kind of cohesive Trinidadian or even Caribbean, um, you know, synoptic report. 
but that's I think that's years years down the road because we kind of need to do research in our own carcinomas first to figure out what's relevant etc cetera, etc cetera. so we just kind of do how we've been trained and then feel the questions from the oncologist wow that's that's pretty neat so you get to like develop your own protocols potentially so potentially yeah potentially <laughs> but i mean you know that's a whole long that's a different conversation entirely i guess i'll ask okay i might ask one follow-up question yeah. then. um since you know you you seem to be you know your your department has both exposure from both british and american so there are some differences in diagnoses, right? For example, for Barrett's esophagus, uh, I know that the British way looks at like the goblet cells differently. So it how, would, look how would you cells, resolve right. <laughs> Or you like sometimes they count it or not? How, how, like, how do you guys reach a consensus in this scenario? I'm just curious. That's another good question. So for, I was sick to Barrett's. So when I call from the US system, obviously, you know you need to see the goblet cells and the British just need to see columnar cells. They don't need to see goblet cells at all. So I call goblet cells and I would put, and I usually talk to my GI docs and most of my GI docs are trained in these states as well. So it kind of locks out for me, but I would put at the bottom per US guidelines. So sometimes if you have something coming in, like I would have to render a second opinion, say on a case and say someone called it Barrett's who's trained in the, in the English system, I would address that. I would say in the English system, um, no goblet cells are required to, to call something um, Barrett's. Um, in the US system, it would. What it takes here is a lot of explanation, both in the reports. So if you look at my reports now compared to my reports when I was in the US, there's a lot more explanatory kind of notes to just to make sure that um, to make sure that everyone is sort of satisfied. So it makes it kind of, it, it, it's more work, um, but you kind of need to appeal to everyone. So it's a lot of, it's a lot more phone calls than you're probably used to. And it's a lot more writing to just say, hey, this is what it is, hey, et cetera. And we do have MDTs, um, tumor boards. So that makes for, you know, um, review of cases and, and conversation around particular diagnoses. Wow, thank you. That's very insightful. Okay. okay, thank you all for your questions. So if there aren't any more, I would like to give you some real time feedback. Um, we sent out a poll and this is what presents had to say. Um, they, this is exactly what they needed. It was very intriguing. It was cool, interesting, very informative, really enjoying it. Um, amazing. So that's a real time <laughs> reaction. Uh, thank you very much, guys. I actually am sort of recovering from COVID. So that means a lot to, to hear. It was a little bit of a struggle. So I apologize for the coughing and the misspeaks, but I'm glad you all got something out of it. And please, um, Demiola, send my email address to those people who are interested because I'm always about collaborating. Will do. And we do hope you feel better soon. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> all right, so, take care. So I'll just like to close with a vote of thanks. So I truly hope everyone had a wonderful and learning experience. <clears throat> um, we sent a feedback form. Um, we would truly appreciate if you can take a minute to fill out the form because we need to have it for documentations for improving our sessions in the future. So Pope Francis said, to change the world, we must be good to those who cannot repay us. And I think that is so fitting today. I'd like to extend a hearty thank you, our future speaker, Dr. Melanie Johnsela. We've learned today about your life on the road in surgical pathology and your bias <laughs> to gastrointestinal pathology. And we're extremely grateful for, dem for you demonstrating your passion in pathology through this CPAMC platform. And we urge you to continue your great work. We are inspired by your presentation and the great words as you see. Um, last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you for attending and participating this evening, and we look forward to, for your continued support for all our UE students and staff across three campuses. 
the University of the Ottawa and Eastern Ontario Laboratory Regional Association, and to our specially invited guests locally and internationally, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this marks the end of our session. Thank you for joining us for our 15th installment of SIPAMSI, and we hope to see you at our future events. Good evening, all. Make it last for